Would you join me for a word of prayer? Loving God, open our hearts and minds to hear these words of Jesus, and may the words of my mouth and the meditations of all of our hearts be acceptable in your sight. You are our rock and our redeemer. Amen. Well, we're continuing this fall series called The Heart of Christianity, where we are journeying through the Sermon on the Mount and asking the question, how can we take these teachings of Jesus and uh, apply them to our lives? Uh, How can we take these teachings of Jesus and make them relevant to what we say and do each and every day? And today we move ahead into Matthew chapter 6, and we come to the topic of prayer. When I first came to Woodmont, Uh, Just over nine years ago, I was very young. I think I still am young, but I was definitely young then, 27. And one of the things that I did was I sought out some older, more seasoned, perhaps wiser ministers and asked them for the best advice that they could give me. And I talked to ministers in this town and ministers around the country, and here are a few of the things that they had to say. One person said, remember to do one thing at a time. You can't do it all in one day. There's always a lot to do, and you will get overwhelmed if you try to do everything at once. Another person said, don't overreact to any kind of feedback. If you get positive criticism, don't get a big head. If you get negative criticism, don't let it tear you apart. Another said, make sure that you pray every single day. Somebody said, be careful when you hire staff. Make sure that you hire team players that can work together with other people and they can get along with others. Somebody said, remember, you have to fill your own cup before you can go and fill the cup of others. If there's nothing in your own cup, you have nothing to pour out. And still another said, pray, pray, and pray some more. Somebody said, make sure you exercise on a regular basis and keep yourself in good shape because apparently it gets more difficult as you get older. And still another said, make sure you cultivate a healthy prayer life because there is no substitute for time spent in prayer. Now, do you see a theme that emerged in this string of advice? Last Sunday, there was a minister here in Nashville, somebody that I have admired for uh, some time, who stood up before his church and made a surprising announcement. Pete Wilson founded Cross Point Church along with his wife 14 years ago, and he sought to establish a church where everybody is welcome because nobody's perfect. Uh, Not only is that admirable, that's at the heart of the gospel. And he did it, he did it well. But last Sunday, he stood up in front of his congregation and he said, leaders who lead on empty don't lead well. He said, I love this church, but but I am tired and I am broken. I've admired Pete for many years, his charisma, his ability to reach the unchurched and the de-churched and to draw them into the community at Cross Point. In fact, Cross Point has been one of the fastest growing churches, not only in Nashville, but in the entire country. But he stood up last Sunday and openly and honestly he said, I'm tired and I'm broken. I've been leading on empty. Any leader who's telling the truth has been there before. Today, I'm talking about a topic that has the potential, that has the ability to change and transform your life but only if you let it. Prayer. Prayer is one of those things that we believe in. It's one of those things that we talk about a lot, but the truth of the matter is, very few of us have been successful in cultivating a regular prayer life on a daily basis. Prayer can be the answer to so many of the problems that we face in life, loneliness, stress, fear, anxiety, broken relationships, illness, addictions, you name it, but only if we cultivate and sustain a healthy prayer life. Thomas Merton said prayer is an expression of who we are. We are a living incompleteness. We are a gap, an emptiness that calls for fulfillment. Gandhi once said prayer is not asking, it's a longing of the soul. 
It's a daily admission of one's weakness. And it's better in prayer, he said, to have a heart without words than to have words without a heart. Kierkegaard said the function of prayer is not to influence God, but rather to change the nature of the one who prays. And Rick Warren, who's at Saddleback Church in Los Angeles, said the more you pray, the less you'll panic. The more you worship, the less you'll worry. The, you'll feel more patient and less pressured. And I think every single one of us longs for that in life. We have this marriage and family seminar going on on Wednesday nights right now. And uh, Jim Schleicher kicked it off this past Wednesday with a topic that is incredibly relevant uh, to this particular time in history. And that is the topic of anxiety. We live in an age of anxiety. The epidemic is here. Families feel this. Couples feel this. Anxiety is a reality that we all have to face. And um, anxiety affects everybody differently. But remember how Paul Tillich differentiated between fear and anxiety. He says fear has an object which can be faced, analyzed, attacked, and endured. You're afraid of heights. You're afraid of public speaking. You're afraid of abandonment. You can name it. But anxiety, he says, has no object. Or it's basically being afraid, but you don't know what you're afraid of. And anxiety is contagious, and it's become a real problem in our culture. But prayer is one of the best ways that we can deal with anxiety, no matter how old we are, no matter what stage of life we might be in, and no matter what we might be dealing with. Jesus talked a lot about prayer. And not only that, but he practiced it. He went away and he prayed often. He went to the wilderness. He went to the Garden of Gethsemane. Jesus knew that prayer was absolutely essential to maintaining his connection with God. In the Sermon on the Mount, he says, Whenever you pray, do not be like the hypocrites, for they love to stand up and pray in the synagogues and at the street corners so that they may be seen by others. Truly, I tell you, they have received their reward. They have been seen. They have been noticed. They've had their moment in the spotlight. He says, when you pray, go into your room and shut the door and pray to your father in secret. And your father who sees in secret will reward you. Why did Jesus say this? See, Jesus understood that prayer must be an escape from the stress and the hustle and bustle of life, the busyness, the craziness that keeps our blood pressure up and that keeps all of us in a state of panic. Prayer can break that cycle, but only if we are intentional about shutting everything else out and having an intimate conversation with God. Let me give you an example from uh, my marriage. So Megan and I have been married seven and a half years. We have three kids, six four and a half, he'll tell you, and 10 weeks. Things are crazy at our house, not as crazy as Farrell and David Mason's house, but things are crazy at our house. And I can talk to Megan throughout the day. I can talk to her when the kids are having breakfast. I can talk to her when we get home from work. I can talk to her when we're eating dinner, when we're getting the kids bathed, getting them ready for bed. But none of that is a substitute for Megan and me going out to dinner and having a one-on-one -on -one conversation. Or Megan and me getting on an airplane and flying somewhere and taking three or four days just to ourselves. That type of conversation is much better than trying to talk in the midst of the craziness of everyday life. Well, that's what Jesus is saying about prayer. He says, when you pray, go and shut the door and pray in secret. He continues, when you're praying, do not heap up empty phrases as the Gentiles do, for they think that they will be heard because of their many words. In, in other words, you know, you don't have to say fancy prayers for God to hear you. I grew up as a preacher's kid. So I've heard some pretty amazing prayers in my day by ministers, by elders, by deacons. They get to the communion table and they can just say some fabulous things. But Jesus says, no, it's not the fancy theological words that matter. It's the state of your heart. Are you honest? Are you authentic? 
God knows what's going on in your life, so you don't need to try to fool God. It's better to have a heart without words than to have words without a heart. Jesus cares about our motive. If God knows what we're going to ask before we ask it, then there's not anything that we can say to impress the master of the universe. And just in case we still need help, which we do, Jesus gives us a prayer. He says, here, pray this way. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts, our sins, our trespasses, as we have forgiven our debtors. And lead us not into the time of trial, but rescue us from the evil one. For if you forgive others their trespasses, your heavenly Father will forgive you yours. But if you do not forgive others, then neither will your heavenly Father forgive your trespasses. So not only is Jesus saying the prayer is important, he's saying that it needs to be intentional, that we need to be focused, that we don't need to heap up fancy theological words. He's saying that we need to forgive if we want to be forgiven. But he's also saying, here, I'm giving you a prayer. Use it if you'd like. And we say this prayer every week when we gather to worship. But the question is, do we understand what we are saying? Do we understand what these words mean? One theologian unpacked it this way. Our Father, not mine alone, but stretching beyond family, race, class, and religion, reaching to everyone everywhere. Our Father, the one who takes responsibility for us as family, the one who cannot do anything but the loving thing. Hallowed be your name. May we reverence in thought and word and deed your name, your character, May we see as holy the very nature of who you are. Your kingdom come, your kingdom of peace and justice, wholeness and abundance. May it come because we seek it above all else and put it in our prayers where Jesus did, first in consideration and first in allegiance. Your will be done. Your will for the only way that life is meant to work. Your will for the kingdom life to be revealed on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, not bread for me alone, but for everyone, your entire human family, not bread for the rest of my life, but for today. For we know that when we seek first your kingdom, all these things, food and clothing, and all that we need shall be added as and when we need them. And forgive us our sins. Forgive us our desires for luxuries that make others do without necessities. Forgive us holding on to tomorrow's bread that should be shared today. Forgive us as we forgive others, not resenting what they have, who they are, how you have gifted them. And lead us not into temptation, but away from evil. Guide us, all of us until evil is no longer a temptation for us. For yours is the kingdom and the power and the glory. You still rule now in our world today. You rule with kingdom power and kingdom glory. Amen. Let me ask you this. Why is developing a prayer life on a regular, consistent basis one of the hardest things for us to do as Christians? Why do so many of us say that we believe in the power of prayer, yet we still don't pray? I think it could be that many of us have convinced ourselves that prayer doesn't work. We've tried it, and we didn't get the results that we were looking for. And so we don't know what to do about that. So prayer might be a nice, pious thing to do. It might help us be still and quiet for a few minutes, but we're not sure that it actually changes anything. Jerry Sitzer wrote a book back in 2003 called When God Doesn't Answer Your Prayers. And in the book he says, ultimately God's greatest answer to prayer is far different from what we could imagine. It's not what God does for us that demonstrates his greatest answer to prayer. It's what God does in us. 
God wants to change us to his liking, not change the world to our liking. Eugene Peterson once said, prayers are not tools for doing or getting, but for being and becoming. Oswald Chambers said, to say that prayer changes things is not as close to the truth as saying prayer changes me, and then I go and change things. When we pray to God, we are asking for God to transform us through the power of the Holy Spirit. And that gives us the strength and the hope that we desperately need to face whatever it is that we have to face in life. Now, does that mean that we should not ask God for answers to specific situations? Absolutely not. I would never say that. But as long as we are just looking to God to meet our requests and our will, I think we're missing the point. Prayer should change who we are and how we see the world around us. Prayer should not leave us the same. Sitzer says God's greatest gift, according to Jesus, is none other than the gift of the Holy Spirit who takes up residence inside of us, helping us to become more and more like the presence or like the person God wants us to be, regardless of our circumstances. We think we know what's best. We think we know how it should happen. We think we know how everything should play out in our lives. But that's usually not the case. We must do a better job of listening and letting God lead us. We might get answers that we would have never expected and never thought possible. A friend of mine who's in the ministry one time reminded me over lunch. He said, Clay, remember, God is God and we are not. God is God and we are not even though we sometimes try to be. In 36 years of living on this earth, I have come to realize this and accept this. And as frustrating as it might be when things don't work out the way that we want them to or the way that we think they should or the way that we plan for them to, we must be patient and let God work through prayer. We should never stop praying and we should never stop letting God change who we are and how we think and how we act. And how we feel. G.K. Chesterton once said, more things are wrought by prayer than this world will ever know. Prayer works because it changes us at our core. It renews us. It gives us a fresh perspective. Two people can be facing the same situation in life, and the one who prays on a regular basis is going to handle it so much better. I'll close with these words that I think are are powerful. I'll leave you with these words today. I asked God for strength that I might achieve. I was made weak that I might learn humbly to obey. I asked for health that I might do greater things, but I was given infirmity that I might do better things. I asked God for riches that I might be happy, but I was given poverty that I might be wise. I asked for prayer that I might have the praise of men, but I was given weakness that I might feel the need for God. I asked God for all things that I might enjoy life. I was given life that I might enjoy all things. I got little of what I asked for, but everything that I had hoped for. Almost despite myself, my unspoken prayers were answered, and I am among all people most richly blessed. Amen.